So what do we talk about when we talk about translation, dangerous translations? Um, the first thing that may come to mind um, are translators working in zones of conflict, um, literally in the line of fire in order to facilitate dialogue between conflicting parties um, and intervening often on, on behalf of the citizens. Um, but translation can also be dangerous outside these conflict zones. Um, in 1536, William Tyndale was burned at the stake for his translation into English of the New Testament, um, and the books were burned alongside him. Um, more recently, in 1991, um, the Italian translator of Salman Rushdie's The Satanic Verses was attacked in his home, and the Japanese translator was murdered. Um, and even, even now, um, the, the Turkish publisher of William S. Burroughs' the, the Soft Machine is, is under trial um, for obscenity. And so so these, these things are still going on, and translations are, have been persecuted, and the translators have been persecuted uh, over time. And I think that the, these acts of violence um, toward the translations and translators are symptomatic um, of the sort of a fundamental quality of translation, which is that it challenges uh, cultural norms, linguistic norms, and also kind of the way we see the world. Um, Bonnie Huey, in her uh, discussion of Tiumantin's uh, notes of crocodile, says, um, it takes an unfamiliar voice, if sometimes a damaged one, to reveal something of humanity to itself. Um, I thought that that was a really beautiful way of describing translation, and, and it seems to me also part of what makes translation in general dangerous, um, and that sometimes those things that are revealed are not what we would necessarily want to see, um, or things that we are not always ready to see. And so the panelists uh, that we have here today, each um, very, very talented and celebrated in his and her own right, um, are going to talk a little bit about the way their work has engaged um, politics uh, through translation. Um, Sarah Khalili, to my left, your right, um, is an editor and translator of contemporary Iranian literature. Her translations include Censoring an Iranian Love Story by Sharyar Mayanipur, Kissing the Sword, a Prison Memoir by Shanush Parsipur, The Book of Fate by Parnush Sani, and The Pomegranate Lady and Her Sons by Goli Taragi. She has also translated several volumes of poetry by Farooq Farokasa, Simi Bevani, Siavash Hazrai, and Feridun Mushiri. Her translations of short stories have appeared in the Literary Review, the Kenyan Review, the Virginia Quarterly, Epoch, Words Without Borders, and Pan America. Um, then Bonnie Huey was awarded a Penn Translation Fund grant in 2012 for her translation from the Chinese of the novel Notes of a Crocodile, uh, which is forthcoming from NYRB Classics. Um, the book was written by the late Taiwanese counterculture icon Tsiu Maozian. Her translations include fiction, essays, and art criticism, and she occasionally writes about photography and modern Japanese literature. Her work has appeared in the Brooklyn Rail, Kyoto Journal, and After Image. She lives in Tokyo. Robin Creswell is an associate professor of comparative literature at Yale University and poetry editor of the Paris Review. He is the translator of Avel Zapata's Kilitos, excuse me, the, the Clash of Images by New Directions in 2010, and Sonali Ibrahim's Death Smell and Notes from Prison, also published by New Directions in 2013. His essays and reviews um, have appeared in uh, Harper's Magazine, The New York Times Book Review, and The Nation, among other publications. A former fellow of the Coleman Center at the New York Public Library, he is the recipient of the 2013 Roger Shannon Prize for Criticism. And I will give the floor to them. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for coming. Um, unfortunately, there are many countries in this world where there are no shortages of issues that could lead a work of literature 
to be um, labeled as dangerous or subversive and hence their translation be unwelcome uh, by the ruling government or regime in power. Um, it, in a lot of countries, the slightest mention of uh, the most ordinary social, economic, or political uh, commentary could lead a book to be banned or um, for the writer and translator to be um, not so welcome in that market. Uh, one of the, I, I'm going to be reading two very short excerpts from two very different books. The first one uh, is by uh, one of the most celebrated contemporary Iranian uh, women writers. Her name is Sham Nush Parsipur. Uh, she is a very outspoken proponent of women's rights. Over the years, well, for the past 30 years, all of her works have been banned uh, in Iran. She's not allowed to be published or sold in uh, any ways. Uh, the only way her books are available in her home country is on the black market. She has spent, uh, well, she was put in prison four separate times for a total of about nine years. One of the times uh, that she was put in prison, it was because in her novel, Women Without Men, there were three or four sentences of dialogue between uh, two young women talking about virginity. And uh, that was cause enough for her to spend several years in prison. Now, uh, when Sharnush left Iran in 1995 to live in exile here in the U.S., she sat down and wrote a book that was far more problematic and troublesome uh, for the government. It's her prison memoir. I'm going to read uh, just a few paragraphs from it. It was nighttime. The prisoners were lying down on the floor, pressed against each other. But to my surprise, they were all awake. Total silence reigned over the unit. It was a strange scene. Contrary to all other times, there was no line at the bathroom door. Instead, a few prisoners had gathered around the radiator, and they were taking turns climbing on top of it so that they could look out from the window set high in the wall. When I walked out of the bathroom, I saw Iran climb down from the radiator. She was shaking. She took me by the arm and whispered that the bodies of the executed prisoners had been laid out on one side of the courtyard. That night, starting at 11 o'clock, we had heard an ear-splitting noise every few minutes. One of the guards had explained that they were building visitors' rooms and that the noise was from the steel beams being dropped to the ground. Just then, we heard it again, and Iran started to shake even more. I asked her what the noise was. She said, heavy machine guns. I didn't know what a heavy machine gun was. I left her and walked back to my room. I felt uneasy. Now I was looking more carefully at the women. They were silent and staring directly ahead. Faride, who managed the room across the hall, was standing in the doorway. I asked her what is going on. She said, can't you hear it? It's heavy machine gun fire. And she explained that when they carried out mass executions, they used heavy machine guns. And what we had been hearing all day was the sound of hails of bullets being fired in the courtyard. She then explained that everyone was quiet so that they could hear the single shots. After every shower of bullets, a single shot was delivered to the head of each prisoner. The women were silent, counting the single shots. So far, there had been more than 90. Faride said, listen. I could hear the muffled sound of gunfire. I returned to my room and quickly told all this to Golshan and the other women. The sound of steel beams crashing to the ground took on a different meaning. We too started to count. The night passed bitterly. The prisoners counted more than 250 single shots. The next day, the state newspaper published the names of some 300 prisoners who had been put to death the night before. 
By the end of September, the number of prisoners who could not walk had soared. Regular floggings had caused the soles of their feet to swell to the size of oranges. The worst part was that they had great difficulty using the Chinese-style squat toilets. As a result, a group of prisoners built a store, sort of Western-style toilet using a large empty cheese can. They covered the rim with a strip of thick foam ripped from a mattress and tied it in place with a piece of yarn. Two or three people would lift the prisoner and sit her on top of the can. This would take place many times during every day. It was now in the middle of November. The prison population had swelled far beyond capacity. More than 350 women swarmed around our unit. At night, many were forced to stand alongside the walls because there wasn't enough room even to sit. The trials and executions continued and even these were becoming routine. I was tired and dispirited. I felt the weight of all those corpses on my shoulders. But in truth, deep in my heart, I was somehow happy that I was in prison during that terrifying time. When you are free, you inevitably feel compelled to act, but when incarcerated, you are powerless to do so. The breadth of the disaster unfolding was far greater than my capabilities, far greater than even the capabilities of the mightiest political groups. Still, I had a long road ahead of me before I would discover the darker aspects of the new revolutionary Iran. Now, bearing in mind that uh, she spent four years in prison, just one of her prison terms, for having mentioned uh, virginity in three or four sentences in a novel. About uh, 17 years later, when Iran's uh, former president was adamantly stating and insisting that there are no homosexuals in Iran, a very young, talented Iranian writer uh, was bravely, some would say recklessly, writing a small novella. And uh, I'm going to read just uh, the beginning of it for you. I don't think any explanation is necessary. The title of the book is I Will Grow, I Will Bear Fruit, Fix. I am 21. I am a homosexual. I like the afternoon sun. My apartment is in the outskirts of town, near the wharf, in a place that is the realm of seashells, the realm of corals, adjacent to the eternal sorrow of the turtles. My mother lives in the waters, in the remains of an old ship, on a bed of seaweed. Her hair blazes like a silver crown above her head. My mother is always naked. She visits me every now and then at my apartment in the outskirts of town. She first crosses the wharf. She floats in the scattered scents of the bazaar. Then she pays a visit to the crowd of fishermen in the seaside cafes. Among their wares, a hidden pearl. And she leaves them and heads for my bed. Of course, along this entire route, she is no less naked. Poker, that is what I call him. He is my only friend. We met during military training. He is 21. He likes the afternoon sun, and he is not a homosexual. I consider this a threat. I have never talked to anyone about my sexual inclination. In fact, I hide it, even from my few sexual partners. With them, I pretend it is my very first such experience. My sexual partners are night prowlers, strangers. Poker is not a night prowler. Poker is not a stranger. And this is chipping away at me from the inside. Poker left a few minutes ago. His scent is everywhere in the apartment a fragrance wafting in the ultimate stir of the constellations. From the window overlooking the sidewalk, I watched him leave. My arms and thighs were aching. 
I am completely helpless when confronting him. I know I will soon lose him and there will be nothing I can do. He will finally choose someone, someone not of the same sex. It is natural after all. How can I talk to him about my inclinations? He may even end our relationship or at best look at me differently, the same way others might look at me. I remember the few times when he inadvertently and in passing stated his position, a position that makes me feel anxious and hopeless. He said, this is one thing I cannot digest. Sometimes when I come across one of them, I just want to puke. When all this goes through my mind, I become disgusted with life, with myself, with poker. And now I feel dizzy. I snuff out my cigarette in my teacup. I go to the bathroom and undress in front of the mirror. I'm even aroused by the sight of my own naked body, especially my arms and neck. I also like looking at my shoulder blades in the mirror. Occasionally, when poker takes off his shirt and to relax, puts on an, an elaborate show of flexing his muscles, I go completely crazy. Air bubbles burst in my lungs and my muscles contract. I'm still stand, standing naked in front of the mirror. My scalp itches. I rush over to the bathtub. Achenaton, as usual, naked and holding a chalice of opium, is, lie, is lying in the tub, staring at me. Slowly, so as not to disturb anything, I climb in. He nimbly opens his arms, and I sprawl out over his eternal nakedness. We'll have comments at the end. Yes. <coughs> oh, I just want to say thank you to the Penn Transition Committee for making this happen and for to all of you, um, my fellow translators, for joining us. Or, or really? Yeah. Um, and thank you for all of you. Uh, thank you for coming here today. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, the author I'm going to read to you today is someone who was obscure when she was alive and uh, who shot to fame only after she died. And I know a lot of translators don't even hope for something like that. Um, so I kind of want to say a few words of appreciation for a translator I really admire, uh, who I never had any contact with. Um, in retrospect, I feel that uh, there was one book that had a really profound impact on me, and uh, that book was a translation from the Italian of Leo Pardi's Moral Essays, and it was translated by a British translator named uh, Patrick Cray. Um, it's a very pessimistic and dark book that also contains some of the most beautiful thoughts I've ever read. And it was pretty much the first book I, where I ever read where I was like, wow, this was translated. And from that point on, I really started to pay attention to translators' names. Um, there's also this story about how he worked at a literary festival in uh, Italy in 1967 and he served as an interpreter uh, for Allen Ginsberg during his reading of this poem, uh, Who Be Kind To, if you know this poem, it's uh, like, uh, Be Kind To Yourself is one, there's only one, imperishable. And he was actually interpreting from English into Italian. And of course this poem is filled with um, images of um, naked body parts and touching and uh, war imagery and uh, someone called the police. And the translator was uh, detained and arrested for obscenity. And when I read that, I kind of thought, you're my hero. Um, Patrick Cray died about a year and a half ago, and he was 81 years old. Um, it has no relation to my work, except that now I feel very moved <laughs> when I think about him. And I never got a chance to say that. So. Um, I want to start by saying that. Um, so, I think risk taking in general is something that I really value um, in translation as in any other art. And that's because it means that you're willing to suffer consequences for something that you value. 
I think that the question of what artistic risk means is still very relevant um, in societies that have relative political freedom or freedom of expression because it means that it's all much harder to create something that is of actual consequence. Um, when governments are authoritarian, it's immediately clear when a work has power. Um, the human cost of achieving the power is too great. But um, what is the alternative? Um, in taking part in this panel, we were all asked to talk a little bit about what our idea of a, trans, of a dangerous work or an endangered work was. And I think one of the most important ones that came to mind for me was the idea of a work that is vested with its own moral authority, um, meaning that it doesn't represent received values. I think very often people are willing to uh, a kill or die for received values. Um, and I want to contrast that with um, some works that I think are uh, very, very benign seeming that bring us into contact with foreign cultures, but ultimately um, serve to um, serve the purpose of nationalism. I think sometimes that is a filter that's, that shapes uh, our perception and our appreciation of um, literature uh, from around the world. And by that specifically, I mean um, immigrant narratives that express uh, gratitude and um, just representations of uh, foreign cultures that make them seem very dangerous, um, very socially uh, unequal. Um, and I think, you know, you may not encounter any danger in translating those works, but uh, there's a certain price to them. So I think that Mm. There are certain qualities that I would look for in a work that make them not not make it not very useful in that sense. I think that um, when different social groups come into contact with each other, there uh, are many sensitive issues. And that's partly why I chose the author that I'm going to talk about now, because she took a very risky approach in that um, she basically represented a kind of disadvantaged group in a way that is pretty much counter to the logic of um, activism in that uh, her representation is very, um, in certain ways, negative. And in a way, it became very successful. Um, so, and it made her into something of a countercultural icon. Um, the book I'm talking about is called Note to the Crocodile, and it was published in 1994. Um, it was written by a Taiwanese uh, writer named Chi Mountain. Um, the crocodiles in the title refer to uh, homosexuals, and uh, Chi herself was an out lesbian. Um, the book is structured as um, a kind of survival guide for young people. Um, and its success is kind of complicated by the fact that uh, she wrote it when she was so young, and then about a year after it was published, she killed herself. Um, the actual uh, 
material comes from her diaries. So it's basically her most private emotions, um, some of her uh, more philosophical thoughts, uh, as well as her conversations with friends, and um, odes to uh, the artists and writers that she most admired. And it also contains uh, a little bit of satire um, about uh, Taiwanese society and its uh, curiosity about uh, homosexuals at the time. Um, the characters in the book are also very morally complex in that um, it's a kind of a college novel and the people in it are kind of like misfits or malcontents and they range from being like juvenile delinquents um, to people who are in some other way like troubled. Um, there are at least two characters who engage in like self-injury and uh, they're more well-adjusted characters but everyone's a little bit troubled. And there are all these students who go to basically the most difficult to get into university in Taiwan. So it's not uh, the best image of either like um, this subculture of homosexuality or um, of you know the nation's brightest. So it's helpful to know that uh, the author has this background in clinical psychology because everybody is a little bit like a case. And you, there's a lot of suffering and unhappiness in this book, but um, it's also there to show how everybody is a prisoner and uh, they're trying to find their own way out. And maybe there's no happy ending in this novel, but uh, it's a kind of work that has served as a callus to a lot of people in that when there's no uh, resolution, it means it's up to you as a reader to kind of complete the story. Um, and one thing that's kind of worth mentioning in this discussion of uh, sexuality and gender is how she, the narrator, um, aligns herself with um, all these uh, artists who uh, follow this archetype of like, the artist as exemplary sufferer. And it's usually just a male archetype, but it's really important because it kind of shows the degree to which she, it, uh, her suffering comes from um, the notion of uh, gender and the tension that um, is expressed both in the content and in the form. So I'm gonna to read to you um, something that uh, shows a little bit of uh, the way that those two things come together. Um, this narrator uh, who is a college student uh, she has this eye on this other girl, and uh, is, this girl's a little bit older than her, and uh, she sees your miserable, kind of like, you're miserable like me, and this crush develops. And one day, out of nowhere, um, this other girl transfers into her uh, Chinese Literature 101 class, uh, which is kind of ideal for her because she's a little bit of a you know, show off and she's kind of poppy, and it's kind of a, a good position for her to be uh, trying to impress this woman. And so a relationship develops. So I'm gonna to read to you uh, a little bit of that. As crime tide tide inch near, I anticipated, I schemed, I feared. I had to be prepared for a fight to the death. She was used to relying on other people. I had a habit of looking after girls. If she was in class at a set time for a set time, I was there to soak it up. In class, I was a show off, but from the moment classes ended to the moment they started up again, I was gone. Her long hair trailed over her shoulders. Her elegant clothing gave her the appearance of being about 24 or 25. That entire year, I went for a kind of misfit look. 
wearing out of fashion jeans that made me look barely 15 or 16. She was like a pendulum's motion between school and home. I'd sleep until the sun disappeared off the western horizon. Then I'd cut loose from my cave like a charged particle and hit the town like a social butterfly. Hindered by shyness, she had refused to socialize. Cunningly, I changed all that. Two very different types of people, mutual attraction. And for what reason? It's hard to believe this thing beyond the imagination of the chess game known as the human condition. It's based on the gender binary, which stems from the duality of yin and yang, or some unspeakable evil. But humanity says it's a biological construct. Penis versus vagina, chest hair versus breast, beard versus long hair. Penis plus chest hair plus beard equals masculine. Vagina plus breast plus long hair equals feminine. Male plugs into female, like key into lock. And as a product of that coupling, babies get punched out. That product is the only object that can fill a square on the chessboard. All that is neither masculine nor feminine becomes sexless and is cast into the freezing cold waters outside the line of demarcation, into an even wider demarcated zone. Man's greatest suffering is born of his mistreatment of his fellow man. She agreed to stay over at my place. I was like a little girl who was finally able to buy a long coveted doll in the store window. At 10 in the evening, heading home from private tutoring on Changchun Road, I took a 74 bus down Pusing South Road, picking it up along the way. She waved as she stood at the bus stop, an overcoat draped over her shoulders, a spotless white rucksack by her side. A woman ready to elope was she. I, as I looked out at her, she was almost like a vine, extending one slender, delicate branch towards my window, hoping I was the direction of the sky, not knowing that inside that window there was no shade and not much sunshine either. Like two sparkling gemstones, we were shakily carried to campus by the 74 bus. I gave her a ride on my bike. She quietly sat sideways in the back. I started singing a song that was popular back in high school, Peddling to the Rhythm. It streamed out to the flowers and trees that lined Yellen Avenue, and which grew vaster the further we rode. I couldn't see her face. I was dying to see the Zephyr the human goddess herself. Waiting for the sun, waiting for you, and the wild lily has its spring too. Those were the songs that defined my high school days. My favorite Sylvia Chang songs the one I love best, flower on the sea, standing on top of the world, or she goes walking by the sea. They capture the mood of each of her major periods. Love Song 1980, Love Proverbs, and Little Sister were Lodayo's biggest hits. To my 17-year-old self, Sylvia Chang and Lodayo were equivalent to a dab of some kind of cosmetic powder a soundtrack applied to cover up teenage heartbreak. After high school, I couldn't remember the names of songs and singers anymore, but I still knew the words by heart. And you? She said that night she wanted to wrap her arms around my waist, but didn't dare to, and really regretted it afterwards. She said it after a few days had passed. Within my catalog of various little memories, that easily went straight to the core. What are you writing, she asked. A journal, I said. What are you writing about in your journal? I'm writing about you coming over. What did you come up with, because I came over? Want me to read it out loud to you? Yes. Tonight's the big night. A certain someone came over for a romp in the hay. That's enough. I want to hear the rest. Scared? Uh-huh. Scared of you. We were in the room on Window Street. I put away the journal. Helped her lay down the bedding. Made her sleep on the bed. I lay down on a plank of hardwood flooring next to the bed. If we were locked up in a mental hospital together, would things be even better, she 
too fast? Will we be locked up in the same room? I don't want to be in the same room. Why not? I'm scared of you. What are you scared of? I'm just scared. What's so great about being locked up together? We could live next door to each other. Our beds would be separated by a wall. I'd sit in my bed and talk to you. You'd sit in your bed too, and we could talk all day long. That'd be so much fun with no one else around. What if we ran out of things to talk about? How can we run out of things to talk about? I pound the wall and say I was tired. Then I go to sleep. After you wake up, you automatically have things to talk about again. Fine, you go to sleep, and I'll write my journal and wait for you to wake up. You're not allowed. You can't keep a journal anymore. I don't have anything. You're only allowed to talk to me. She leaned partway over the edge of the bed to talk, her face peering at me. I wrapped the covers tightly around myself. When you sleep next to me, I suffered, I said. So come sleep here in the bed, she said. That would be the more painful, I said. Mischievously and teasingly, she lowered her body onto my covers. Her hair brushed against my face, and her scent filled my lungs. I pulled her head in close, wrapping her up arms around her neck. My lips were pressed up against her eyelid. She was so tender. It was an awkward embrace, like black rain melting down on snow-covered ground. So that's Chi Miao Jin. Um, her given name, Miao Jin, suggests that um, her inborn gift is her passion. And I hope people see that maybe she realized that uh, only through her work. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, the book that I'm going to talk about is by, uh, it's called Tilkadaiha in Arabic, uh, translated as That Smell. Um, it's by an Egyptian writer named Sanala Ibrahim. Um, and it was published in Cairo in 1966 and was immediately uh, confiscated, although a few copies got out to critics who seemed to have hated it as much as the censors did, or at least pretended to hate it. Um, one of the remarkable things about the novel, though, is that when we read it, um, especially today, 50 years later, um, and in a, in a foreign language, it's not at all clear what would have made it um, seem subversive. And the, the official reason given by the authorities at the time had to do with its representation of sex, uh, sexual matters, but in fact, the sex scenes in the book are uh, rather, they're, they're brief and, and rather chaste. Um, and so there seems to be something else going on. The, the, no, the novel itself doesn't have a lot of plot. Uh, it's, a, it's, a very, it's a minimalist work in, in, in every sense. Um, the action, such as it is, centers on a narrator who um, is wandering around Cairo um, <clears throat> in the mid-60s and uh, visiting friends, visiting family, having kind of desultory conversations, going out to walk the streets some more. He takes a lot of public transportation. Um, and it's all, all this is narrated in this kind of scrupulously exteriorized fashion. Um, there's no commentary on what he sees. And um, he, he, he himself seems to be narcotized in some sense. And, it's, and, and in a way, the novel is about how, why it is that this style would make sense um, for him to be for him to be writing in this way, and the novel is also about a, a protagonist who is trying to write a novel. Uh, we we know that much about him that he, every night he goes back to his apartment and sets down to his desk and, and tries to write something and s ends up smoking a lot of cigarettes instead and, and not getting much done. Um, 
I'll, I'll read to you. Well, one of the reasons why, the, um, well, the city appears to him in, in this very, in part because of the way that he's narrating it, it seems to be this very foreign place to him. Um, he, he remarks on the sort of things that I remarked on too when I was as a foreigner uh, living in Cairo for a while, which are smells and overcrowdedness and the way that transportation works or doesn't work. Um, and what, but the reason why he is struck by all of these things, why he seems to be a kind of tourist in his own native city, um, is that he's just spent five years in prison. And this is what we learned early on in the novel, and so I'm, I'm going to read um, just sort of the opening page or so of the novel in my translation as he's coming out of prison. So this is the, this is the opening of the, of the novel. What's your address? The officer said. I don't have an address, I said. He looked at me, surprised. Then where are you going? Where will you live? I don't know, I said. I don't have anyone. Well, I can't let you go like that, he said. I said, I used to live by myself. We have to know where you're living so we can come at night, he said. One of the policemen will go with you. And so we went into the street, the policeman and I, and I looked around. Curiously. It was the moment I'd been dreaming of for years, and I searched myself for some feeling that was out of the ordinary, some joy or delight or excitement, but found nothing. People walked and talked and acted as if I'd always been with them, and nothing had happened. The policeman said, let's take a taxi, and I saw that he wanted to have an easy time while I paid. We went to my brother's place, and he said to me on the stairs that he was traveling and had to lock up. So we went downstairs and then to my friend's house. My friend said, my sister's here, I can't have you in. We went back down to the street. The policeman was getting annoyed. His eyes had a mean look and I said to myself that he wanted a few piastres. We can't go on like this, he said. Let's go back to the station. <coughs> At the station there was another policeman. You're a problem, he said. We can't let you go. I sat across from him and set my bag on the floor and lit a cigarette, and when it was night, he said there was nothing he could do. He called in a third policeman and said, put him in the holding pen. So they led me to a cell with a fourth policeman standing by the door. He patted me down and took my money and put it in his pocket and pushed me into a big room with a wooden bench all around the walls, and I sat down on the bench. There were a lot of men there, and the door kept opening to let more in. I felt something on my knee. I put my hand down and sensed something wet. I looked at my hand and found a big patch of blood on my fingers and the next moment saw tens of bugs on my clothing and I stood up and noticed for the first time big patches of blood smeared on the walls of the cell and one of the men laughed and said to me, come here. Some of the men were sitting on the ground and one of them had spread a ratty blanket on the ground and I found a little space on the edge and sat there with my chin on my knees. The man with the blanket said to me, why don't you sleep? But there was no room for me, so I said, I'd rather just sit like this. Another one asked me, drugs? No, I said. Robbery? He said, no, I said. Murder? No. Bribery? No. Counterfeiting? No. So the man got quiet and confused and began looking at me with a strange look. So the narrator isn't uh, a criminal, he's a political prisoner. And um, that is the meaning of these negations. And throughout the novel, um, politics is in fact what cannot be talked about. Um, so on this prisoner's, or ex-prisoner's kind of daily rounds with his friends and family, they talk about everything except the political situation in Egypt, which was becoming um, in the mid 60s, sort of more and more dire. And as you can tell, the, the style itself is something, um, it, it's kind of defined by all the things that it leaves out too. It leaves out adjectives, it leaves out um, fancy words, it leaves out authorial commentary, it leaves, leaves out monologues. And, um, and this is a very striking sort of way of writing in certainly in Arabic in the 1960s, when there was a certain uh, code of eloquence, I suppose, that was uh, expected of authors, and which this book completely shatters. And 
there's an interesting, I think, story about how it is that Ibrahim came up with this style, which has to do with what he was reading uh, while he was in prison. And he's written subsequently about how prison was, in fact, his university. Um, and we know what he was reading in prison because about 10 years ago he published the, um, what are called the notebooks, the prison notebooks that he was right working on there, um, and which I've translated some of and, and published as an appendix to the, to the edition of that smell. And the notebooks themselves aren't really a description of daily life in the prison at all. Um, he was worried that if the notebooks had been um, confiscated from him and they had that kind of material in it, then he would be in real trouble. Um, so most of what they, can, they consist of is um, reading notes, basically. And it's remarkable how much reading got done in this prison, which was about a, few, a couple hundred miles from the Sudanese border, so in a very remote area of southern Egypt. But the prisoners, um, although conditions were terrible and they were often tortured, got a lot of reading material. This was done through bribing guards and um, they had friends on the outside who would send them things. And so they were keeping up with what was going on, this is the mid-60s, with the Nouveau Roman in France and they were reading Soviet cultural magazines and they were reading stuff that was being published in Cairo. And so it's astonishing how much um, cultural material was available to them in this very remote corner of the Egyptian desert. So the reading notes consist of, of, of notes on Virginia Woolf, uh, Italian neorealism in film, uh, Yevtuchenko, who was then making the rounds on college campuses in Western Europe and the United States, um, uh, Lukacs and Brecht and debates about realism versus experimentalism and modernism. Um, really a totally remarkable archive of, uh, of writing. And the, the figure that actually keeps on coming up time and time again in this archive is actually Hemingway. Um, and Hemingway is clearly, the minimalism of Hemingway's style is clearly one of the things behind uh, Ibrahim's own very pared down rhetoric. And this is one of the reasons why I was so, I mean, I was sort of surprised um, to learn this and then thought that it would be a real interesting problem or puzzle in translation whether or not this really iconic American style um, could be renewed in some sense and made strange again by taking a kind of detour uh, through Arabic. And I also thought that it was just a, a great story, you know, that we don't, we don't, we tend to think of cultural relations between um, the United States and Egypt, certainly for the last 50 years, as being strained, or the Middle East more generally as being strained. And this was a case in which um, a real influence and a declared influence, an explicit influence of an American writer on, a, 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 in this case, a communist um, Egyptian writer, gave birth to a real, a, a substantial uh, work of art. And I thought that this would be um, something interesting to work on as a translator. So uh, I'll just say something very briefly about the political background to this, because the, the book is itself a kind of Oman clay. Um, Ibrahim himself was a political prisoner and he was a communist. He joined the Egyptian Communist Party in, in 1954 um, and was jailed along with the rest of Egyptian communists by Gamal Abdel Nasser, who had taken control in 1952 in a roundup of Egyptian communists. And this was in 1959. Um, and he spent, he was supposed to be in jail for seven years. He ended up spending um, five because in 1964, Khrushchev uh, visited Egypt on the occasion of opening up the Aswan Dam in the south of the country, and uh, Khrushchev handlers noted that it would be very embarrassing for the Soviets to give Nasser the hero of the Soviet Union medal when his jails were filled with communists. So, uh, so they let out the communists that were in jail, and um, all of them, which is a very small party, in fact, and then two years later, the, the party itself, so right around when these, the, the book was published, um, the, the Communist Party actually voted to dissolve itself. It was one of the very few cases in history when a local, a national Communist Party um, decided voluntarily 
um, and it was voluntary, to dissolve itself. They thought that they could work from within the regime, um, which was not true. Um, so another way of, stand, of understanding why the narrator is such a kind of narcotized voice, I think, um, is that this is a kind of, what I call it, a daze of depoliticization. Um, it's this sense that um, all of the large battles, political battles, have been fought and lost. Um, and one of the, I think, symptoms of this malaise, one of the most common and uh, consistent symptoms of this malaise in Ibrahim's work, in this novel and in others, is uh, his treatment of sexuality. And so I'd I, I read one more um, short piece um, from the novel, which is the narrator's um, encounter with the prostitute, which plays out with this horrible and sort of endearing uh, awkwardness. So here it is. I went in and locked the door behind me. Hassan's brother said from behind the door that the rubber was on the desk. I lit a cigarette and offered her one. She was sitting on the bed in her underclothes wearing a cheap pink shirt with holes in it, like a white rag that had been dipped in blood and washed over and over, but which had kept the faded color of the blood. Her legs were bare. Her skirt was carefully folded on the desk. She said, I don't want to smoke. Let's get it over with. Let's have a cigarette first, I said. What's your name? I want to get this over with, she said, and put her hand out to unbutton my pants. I turned her hand away gently and said, just sleep with me tonight, then leave in the morning. Yeah, right, she laughed and then pulled me toward her, trying to kiss me. I turned my mouth away from her face and stood up and took off my pants and underwear and picked up the rubber and began putting it on, but it ripped. I looked for another one on the desk. There wasn't one. The girl said, I'm clean. I opened the door and called to Hassan. I need one. And he gave me one from his pocket and I put it on and threw myself on top of her. She tried to kiss me so I moved my face away and finally got up and put my clothes on. The other two took her out and I sat down and lit a cigarette. Ramsey came in and, told, and I told him I hadn't been able to sleep, sleep with the girl and he made fun of me. He had managed it. He met a girl in the street and went home with her and turned off the lights. It took 10 minutes. Then he gave her 25 piastres and looked at his face in the mirror. It was red. Nothing is worth anything, he said. Um, so, Ibrahim tells a story actually about um, meeting the censors when this book was published. And they came into the room with a kind of red marked up copy of it and said, and this was the scene that they wanted to interrogate him about, and they said, what's the matter with this guy? Why can't he sleep with the prostitute? Why can't he get it up? And, and this was actually the reason why it was, officially at least, why it was censored. And it seemed to me, um, because what they were afraid of, clearly, is this admission of powerlessness, and explicitly male powerlessness. And this was very much against the literary uh, current, which ran in the direction of a kind of socialist realism at the time, um, where the protagonists of the stories are always supposed to be um, kind of machine gunning the Zionists and um, beating, the, beating the British imperialists if it was a historical novel. Um, and, and so I thought that another reason to do a translation of this novel was precisely because it, of its intelligence, um, that it knew, uh, politically speaking, where the, where the soft points of the regime was. And I'll just add as a, as a coda to this about Sana Ibrahim, who, who is still alive, um, that about 10 years ago, he was given uh, a very uh, lucrative award by the state, uh, this was in 2003, and um, which came with by the Egyptian state, 
by the Ministry of Culture, and um, which came with a very substantial cash prize, and much to the surprise of everybody in the audience, and this was a big kind of gala event um, in the in the central hall of the Ministry of Culture, he actually showed up, and he's well known as a, a dissident, um, and so people were actually surprised that he showed up, and so he got on the podium and he gave a speech in which he excoriated the regime for its foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the United States, um, and said that they had trashed culture, and then ended by saying, and therefore I'm going to reject this uh, prize because it's been bestowed by a state that has no credibility. Um, and, and this was kind of front page news um, in Egypt, and it took another eight years for it really to become clear that the regime had no credibility, or at least the chief officer of the regime had no credibility in Egypt. Um, but in any case, it, the, the book itself, Til um, How That Smell seems to me one of these occasions where there's a real uh, self-critical artistry at work in a moment of political crisis, and that's why it seemed to me important uh, to translate it into English. Thank you. And thank you all for those beautiful um, and, and very varied readings. Um, I, I was particularly interested by the, in spite of their difference, the, the common threads that, that were kind of woven through, um, particularly the use, the artist's use of the body as a means of, and sexuality, you know, as a means of voicing this dissidence or, or um, criticism. Perhaps that's something you'll want to comment on later. Um, but just to get started, um, how did you each come to translate these works? Uh, well, in my case, uh, it was, uh, it, it usually is either uh, an author, a writer, or um, the publisher contacting me. Um, a couple of times, for example, Payon's book, the young man who, uh, who I read a, a you know, short excerpt from. Uh, that book uh, has, of course, never been published in Iran. It was published in Persian by a small European publisher in Europe. And uh, I translated it because he asked me to and because I just fell in love with the book. The English translation has not been published. Um, I don't think it will be easy to find a publisher for it, but it's one of the few occasions where knowing that a translation may never see the light of day, mm -hmm. um, I, I just felt compelled to do it. But usually it's either the writer or the publisher who, you yeah. know. And you raise a really important point. I mean, this is one of the things I was trying to get at with the idea of the endangered translation, you know, that um, not only for political reasons, but also kind of market-based reasons that, that sometimes it's difficult to bring these books into the public view. And I have to tell you, this, what you just mentioned is critical, it, the market-based reasons, uh, especially with respect to Iranian writers and works by Iranians. I, I see it so clearly. Um, you know, when we have a kinder, gentler government ruling in Iran, interest is low. Mm. Um, interest is low in the West. Um, but when we have someone like former President Ahmadinejad, who is on the front page of the newspaper every single day, suddenly publishers become super interested. So mm. it's, it's very much market driven. Which is sort of what you were saying, Bonnie, you know, about the, the, the danger of the kind of nationalist um, edge to translation, sort of the other side of it, and having to be be conscious that that these books might also, you know, be used to to an end that, as as translators, you might not necessarily feel comfortable with. Um, and Robin, you at, a, at another moment you commented uh, similarly, kind of um, after after September 11th of 2001, you know, the the sort of surge in interest and and the way that. Um, kind of has inflected a bit um, the, the reception of these works and, and how, how have you dealt with that? Yeah, there was a, a famous article um, written in 1990 by Edward Said called Embargoed Literature where he talked about how, how difficult it was for him to convince 
um, major American publishers to be interested in Arabic literature, even um, even in the case of Naguib Mahfouz, who had won the Nobel Prize um, a few years earlier, an, an Egyptian writer. Um, and in 1990, I think that was, and he has a, a, an anecdote about talking to a publisher and being told that after basically no books had been selected to be translated, and he inquired as to why and was told by this publisher that Arabic was a controversial language. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that essay was entirely accurate, actually, um, in 1990, but September 11th did change everything, and I think that the same sort of dynamics that you were mentioning are in, in play there, um, because really since 9-11, major American publishers have been interested in works coming out of the Middle East, although I would say that that interest is channeled in, into certain sort of areas and, or subjects, and, and so in the case of um, works from the Middle East, they're especially uh, interested in works having to do with uh, the veil, with the abuse of women, with jihad, with sectarianism, um, and you know, experimental literary works don't really get on the map. But some of the interest kind of trickles down, and so even those of us who work in that kind of um, in that area uh, can occasionally get these these things translated. Um, and, or in the case of my novel, actually retranslated because it, it was translated in the 60s, um, the late 60s. It was almost immediately translated right after it was written in Arabic, but um, but badly translated, I think. Uh, or or at least it wasn't. It, I think that there was a, there was a lot of room for improvement, and, and 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 anyway, works that are really worth it probably should be retranslated every 50 years or so. Um, would you comment a little bit on, on those areas for improvement? What what you saw that needed to be rescued in in the book that wasn't well? Published? So when the when the book was first translated, and I think it's actually 1970, so four years after it was published in Arabic, uh, it was it was translated by a very competent, very distinguished actually Arabist uh, guy named Dennis Johnson Davies, who lived in Cairo and was in touch with Kyrene intellectual circles and and recognized that this was an important work. And, um, but at that time, I think, um, you know, late 60s, early 70s, this is when publishers like Heinemann were publishing stuff from Africa mm -hmm. and the Middle East and, and also um, further afield. Uh, the, the reigning mode of translation was what we might loosely call domesticating translation, which is to say to make these semi-exotic works feel readable in English, and I actually think that that's a perfectly legitimate, um, what, you could make arguments for that um, based on historical circumstances, and in any case, that was, I think, the, the mode. And so this book, which um, in the Arabic text is actually just one block of texts. There's no indents for dialogue, um, and there's no indents for anything. It's just one block of text. It's a clearly, kind of modernist typography. It's an experimental novel, um, and it's very difficult in some ways. This translator, for instance, he put all of the dialogue into this kind of plummy, middle-class British accents, and he made indents for all of the dialogue, and he made it very legible. Um, but I think clearly, especially if you looked at what Sonola was reading before this, which is like Virginia Woolf and Lukacs and uh, Brecht, um, he was very interested in writing something really uh, unfamiliar to his readers, and so I wanted to capture some of that, some of that um, unfamiliarity in the English translation too. Mm -hmm. And and Bonnie and Sarah, when when you're working with these texts that that do have this sort of um, political weight, do you find that that um, affects the your, the English that you use, or do you do you find yourself putting a certain weight on certain terms or, or thinking in, in along those lines when you work, or does that not? Uh, well, uh, in my case, as a translator, I, I feel a huge sense of responsibility um, towards the writer's original work. I don't do that at all. I don't uh, change 
any point of emphasis or I don't um, enhance a tone or um, I don't soften a tone. I try very, very hard to reflect the writer's voice and to remain completely invisible. I, I don't think that it, it is my place to change a vocabulary or uh, a nuance or um, make the shadows smoother or more extreme. So no, I, I would never do that. I mean, if I've ever done it, it's been unintentional. Mm. Did, you, did you find certain terms kind of coming to the fore when you were translating or? Um, yeah, I think I also kind of aimed just to capture someone's voice. Mm -hmm. And that was the first thing that struck me about um, Tina Jin is the way that uh, she kind of mixes like very vernacular types of writing with something that um, that kind of, you can tell that she's read a lot of like French theory, she's fluent in French, that's where she went to graduate school. And um, I think it seemed especially important to try to create like an individual voice because I think somehow it's easy to get the impression that there's like this one type of Chinese, right? And whereas there are like various dialects and uh, it's modernization, right? That is like collapsing them all into one. Mm -hmm. And I think trying to translate uh, like the influence of other literatures, um, and in her case, like Japanese is very, very important. Uh, and um, French into that is really important and English too. Um, yeah, I think that's actually trying to like synthesize and imagine this person as an individual is really important. I mean, I think in the end, I mean, my goal is to translate almost style over content. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, we have about 15 minutes left, so I think if you're all emotionally and psychologically prepared, um, we can open the floor yeah, up to sure. questions from the audience. whether you have ever had a relationship with this author and um, that has affected your translation and you know what, what, what has been gained from that kind of relationship where you've had an a, a opportunity to have a back and forth. Uh, I have worked mostly with uh, writers who are alive and um, I find that uh, exercise of working together, the cooperation, the back and forth, the give and take, I find it extremely helpful and useful. On a couple of occasions, I have uh, translated volumes of poetry by poets who are not with us anymore. And I found it extremely difficult, especially in the case of poetry, because um, if it's a novel or if it's a you know, plain narrative form, uh, it's much easier. But in poetry, especially, in uh, Persian poetry, uh, there are so many metaphors, so many explicit and implicit um, underlying layers to everything. The most politically um, laden uh, verse, you, as the average reader, you would think it's you know some guy expressing his love for the red rose. But that red rose has a very, very strong political symbolism. In that case, I, I had a very difficult time translating poetry of a poet who was no longer there because I was constantly petrified, what if? What if I'm not getting that metaphor? What if I'm missing the point? So uh, for me, it's always been much easier and um, much more rewarding in a way. It's not so much of an... Um, it, it's not so much of a um, lonely work anymore when there's two of you. It's... Yeah, I've never worked on uh, a translation with a dead author, and the ones that I have worked on with live living authors have all been um, made easier by the fact that you can ask them when there is a you know, problem that comes up in the sense. And, and, and oftentimes it's great because, you know, 
it turns out that they were somewhat unclear about what they meant too, and, and those are always um, you know nice moments of conversation and interpretation to talk about. So I, I think it's it's been fun for me to translate authors that you can actually talk to. And you didn't have that chance with this book, Bonnie. Um, not on this project. I kind of like working with dead authors. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm not. <laughs> I seriously do. Partly because, like, in this case, I think, you know, I feel a sense of duty to like make her life mean something. So I think, like, that pressure is kind of good. Thank you all for um, the readings and your information and, and the stories about uh, the books and the authors. I was um, especially interested um, in how the books, well, uh, Bonnie and Robin, how the books were received when they were published, and Sarah, if there was a, a reception outside of um, Iran, if you could uh, talk about that. And um, particularly, Bonnie, um, I'm very unfamiliar with um, uh, gay or queer literature in the Chinese language uh, culture is, um, is there, uh, what, what, what would you tell someone about, uh, and have you indeed written um, um, an introduction or a um, afterward to the translation that contextualizes it for uh, Western audience? Go ahead. Um, I guess well, um, the reception <coughs> was pretty good. Um, got some nice reviews. Uh, there was one, this book came out um, actually over a year ago now, and it was kind of in the middle of the ongoing revolt, revolution, we don't know what to call it yet, in Egypt. Um, and which was sort of lucky, I suppose, for for me, for the translation, but there were there. I remember there was one curious review that um, noted that in my introduction I talk about this kind of explanation of for why the narrator speaks the way he does and writes the way he does as being uh, because he is caught up in this moment of depoliticization of kind of life after politics. And this reviewer was like, well, so why translate this book now when? politics is kind of on the streets and it's exactly what's happening. It seems so untimely. Um, and of course now, another year and a half later, it seems like um, actually the revolution is over and maybe you know, kind of a post-political perspective was, uh, was, the, was the correct disabused one right from the beginning. Anyway, these, um, these kind of delays in, um, in translation and reception are always uh, kind of interesting and, and totally unpredictable. Um, for, in the second part of that question about about um, introducing a work to a Western audience, I mean, I did write an introduction and kind of an extensive introduction, which I would have preferred not to do in a way, but I, I had something to say. So, um, but I, I, what I like about the edition actually is that in a way, by including the um, prison notebooks, which are kind of a prolegomena to, to the novel itself. I mean, they introduce, I think, the novel itself. Um, I think they actually give the pertinent literary context for what you're reading. And I think, it, you know, my own feeling as a translator is that the, the, the less uh, footnotes and critical apparatus you can get away with, uh, the better. And um, I, I was sort of, so, so I was happy to have those, those prison notebooks by the author himself to give the real, the real intellectual context for what was going on, I felt, uh, in the story. Um, I was very pleasantly surprised uh, by the uh, degree of interest uh, that the public had, that the reviewers had in several of the volumes, uh, of the books that I've translated in the past, I don't know, four or five years. Um, the one that was uh, best received was censoring an Iranian love story by Shahriyar Mandanipur. And uh, it, it is a novel that, uh, to put it all in one sentence, in which he dissects the censorship apparatus and the way it operates in Iran. Um, 
I, I think the subject matter was what the reviewers mostly found extremely interesting. And the way he approached it, it wasn't um, a dull academic work. It was a very engaging novel. Um, in terms of the other writers, the other books, there, I have translated a couple of um, works of fiction that are totally non-political in nature. And those have surprisingly been well received also. Again, I think we go back to the comment you made that uh, it's a fickle market. It goes up, it comes down. Sometimes I've been most surprised by the reception that these books have received. Other times, I don't know why there is no interest when I think there should be. Again, I, uh, so far so good, and I, I'm surprised that there has been this much interest in uh, works of fiction from Iran. Sorry, we just we had one more question for Bonnie. Just to, did you want to did you want to respond to Myra's question? Okay, sure. Um, well, Tima Jin was actually relatively obscure when she was alive. Um, she published some short stories and this book, and um, she was actually not famous until she killed herself, and it became kind of sensationalized to the point where she became like a household name and even now I think if you there are people who never who don't really like read books and they know who she is. Um, they just know that she's that lesbian who killed herself lesbian author who killed herself. And but at the same at the same time I think, you know, she has become kind of a crossover um, writer in that it's it's not really, you know, like queer genre fiction at all that uh, her audience is definitely kind of like young people and um, yeah, and just people looking for a kind of like a subculture or alternative culture. Um, so. No, it was, I mean, no, it was well received. It was just that, I mean, she was not well known and um, some of the awards she received didn't uh, arrive until uh, she was dead, and um, many of her works were published after she was dead. So, yeah. And regarding queer sign of bone culture, um, there's one other novel, her last novel, which is also uh, coming out. It's translated by a different translator, um, Ari Lusta Heinrich and it's coming out on uh, NYRB Classics next month. And she has actually, I think, co-edited a book exclusively about that topic. So if people are interested, it's kind of, I mean, a complex thing that people are becoming interested in, so. And I think Taiwan is actually, I don't know, it's, like, it's relatively liberal, you know, and um, in regards to your question about presenting things to like, Western audiences, it's, it's kind of also important to remember that um, modernization is not necessarily a Western thing for like Taiwan and you know they're colonized like many times over the Dutch, the Spanish, and modernization is a very Japanese thing. So I think that's kind of like one point to keep in mind when people think of like oh how how is this you know like uh, internationalist or modernist uh, work. It is, it makes sense to, it just isn't necessarily, well it makes sense to the West of course, but not primarily. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> uh, we have time for one more question, did you wanna? In cases where the author has been censored in the country, do you understand the reaction to the English translation in that country by that government? Okay, sorry, just to repeat it for the, for the video. Um, in, in countries where the author has been censored by that government, um, do you ever see reactions from that government to the translation? Was that the question? Uh, in my case, um, all of the authors I've worked with recently and all of the books I've recently translated have been censored. The authors' uh, works have been banned in Iran for decades. Um, given that I don't live in Iran and I haven't visited in a while, I don't know whether there is any direct reaction. Um, the books uh, are never uh, reviewed. 
uh, as such in state papers or state-sponsored uh, publications, but they do often uh, get reviewed and mentioned on weblogs, on uh, Facebook, on uh, various internet pages which are less controlled by the government. Uh, but as such, the government will not openly recognize the existence of that translation. It is people interested in books and, you know, uh, reviewers who uh, make mention or discuss them in mostly online sources. Um, the book that I the book that I worked on, while it was censored to begin with, um, because of the vagaries of Egyptian politics at a certain point, after Sadat had succeeded Nasser as president, um, <coughs> there was actually some encouragement on the part of the regime to publish sorts of books, which were, by that time had been interpreted as critiques of Nasserism. So this book is no longer, in fact, it's a canonical work of Egyptian fiction at this point, so it's no longer um, a censored work in Egypt. So the translation, as far as I know, didn't it didn't uh, it didn't raise any eyebrows in that one. Okay. Um, well, it looks like we're we're reaching two thirty. So I just wanted to say um, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you to the the organizers of the Pan World Voices Festival and the Translation Committee for organizing this event. And thank you so much to the three of you. Um, I, I really enjoyed your presentations and the conversation.